Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 139 of the American Muslim Experience, and I am your host, Pervez Ahmed. We're still uh, continuing to enjoy our sojourn through Chicagoland, and as we make our various stops, we have the privilege of engaging in a wonderful conversation with an individual, or in this case today, two in particular. This is, um, I think, an episode where we, we are going to try to attempt to tackle, I think, an important conversation, an important topic that I don't see discussed enough. And this is in spite of the fact that we find our community growing older. I mean, just speaking anecdotally, we find ourselves seeing our family grow older, whether it's parents, loved ones, relatives, in-laws, grandparents, in some cases. We are a community that is continuing to grow older. Whether it's the boomers who immigrated here back in the 60s and 70s, or it's uh, Gen X, uh, my generation, who by most estimates would be anywhere from about upper 40s to upper 50s. We are a community that is continuing to grow older. And quite frankly, this topic is often associated with individuals as they get older or something that comes to mind to individuals who are getting older. But the fact of the matter remains is that something like this is something that can impact an individual regardless of age, regardless of health. And so the topic that I'm sort of being elusive about is a topic that, as I mentioned at the outset, doesn't get discussed enough. And that is the topic of palliative care. Palliative care is a crucial part of integrated people-centered health services. Basically what that means is care, whether it's physical, psychological, social, or spiritual, that is administered to those who are suffering from long-term disease, degenerative disease, life-threatening issues, acute trauma, coma from an accident, or end-stage chronic illness, terminal disease. It is care that is provided not only to the patient, but also to the patient's family as they cope through the process of providing care to the patient in need. And as I said, this is a topic that is often associated with end of life, but it's not just limited to that. It is a topic that certainly has implications, issues like living wills and other advanced directives, which are basically written legal instructions regarding a person's preference for medical care if you are unable to make that decision for yourself. Uh, Advanced directives guide choices for doctors and caregivers if a person is terminally ill, seriously injured in a coma, or in a later stage of dementia, or near the end of life. And so that's just one example of a profound implication that palliative care basically deals with. And as I said at the very beginning, This is an issue that people should be thinking about regardless of age, regardless of health, regardless of whether or not one finds loved ones and family members who are of advanced age or you yourself. Because as I said, or as you can imagine, these type of instances where a person doesn't have the wherewithal to make very important decisions regarding their own care is something that can happen regardless of age. To help navigate this very delicate conversation and this very delicate issue, uh, we are joined by two individuals. One is Dr. Aziz Ansari, who is a professor of medicine and is the Associate Chief Medical Officer for Clinical Optimization and Revenue Integrity at Loyola University Medical Center. He graduated from Midwestern University and completed his residency training at Loyola University Medical Center. He is a practicing and board-certified hospitalist and palliative care physician. His responsibilities include utilization management, clinical documentation improvement, care management, inpatient clinical operations, length of stay reduction, overseeing unit medical directors, developing the physician advisor program and incorporating palliative medicine in care delivery for patients with serious illnesses. He also serves as medical director of the observation unit. Dr. Ansari has over a decade of speaking and teaching experience and lectures frequently on the impact hospital medicine has on mid-revenue cycle the role of palliative, primary palliative care in improving healthcare delivery, primary communication skills in serious illnesses, opioid prescribing, and the role of cultural humility in challenging one's implicit biases at the, be- at the bedside. He has published in Cultural Humility and Im- Implicit Biases as it relates to patient care and leadership. 
Lastly, Dr. Ansari has several years of leadership experience in developing primary palliative care training conferences for healthcare executives and clinicians and developments of summit of summits tailored towards physician advisors. So welcome, Dr. Ansari, to the show. And he is joined uh, as our esteemed guest by uh, someone who is no stranger to the show or someone who's certainly not uh, new to the show, and that is Omar Mazafar. Omar Mazafar serves as the Muslim chaplain at Loyola University Chicago, where he addresses addresses theological, personal, social matters for students of all sectarian outlooks. During the school year, he also runs classes on scripture, student life, and other matters. He has received Islamic studies training both through traditional and academic sources. He is a lecturer in the departments of theology and modern languages and literatures. He has taught at the University of Chicago, DePaul University, among other universities and schools. He has taught courses on the Quran, the Sirah, the Hadith, Islamic law, spirituality, purification, Islamic revivalism, Islam and politics, sectarianism, Al-Ghazali, Rumi, Iqbal, Arabic, film, and comparative religions. Across the Muslim community for nearly three decades, he has been giving sermons, officiating weddings, leading classes at Islamic centers. He has worked in de-radicalization. He has given religious services to refugees, and he has spoken out on behalf of survivors of sexual violence. His notable achievements uh, throughout his illustrious career In 2009, the late film critic Robert Ebert named Omer one of his far-flung correspondents, quote-unquote. Omer has been writing film essays for robertebert.com. In 2011, he was granted an Excellence in Teaching Awards in Humanities, Arts, and Sciences through the University of Chicago's Graham School. In 2017, he was named Loyola University's Staff Member of the Year. In 2022, Loyola's Department of Student Diversity and Multicultural Affairs awarded him the Transformative Educator Award, enhancing the success of underrepresented students. So here we are in Naperville, Illinois, at the residence of Dr. Aziz Ansari. And so I want to actually thank you for two things, two reasons, among probably several. One, of course, for hosting us and allowing us to use your lovely home as the place to record this podcast. And number two, quite frankly, for bringing to my radar and my attention, this very, very critical and important topic that I think that uh, doesn't get discussed enough. And oftentimes when we find ourselves in situations where we have to deal with these type of decisions, we are ill-equipped because either we haven't thought them through or frankly even thought of them at all. Or I think obviously there's a lot of emotions involved generally when you're making these decisions. So those that often doesn't lend itself to clarity to begin with. So anyway, so having said all that, thank you so much, uh, Aziz, if you don't mind me calling you. Oh, please. For doing that. And also for being a listener, because I know that you reached out as, as someone who's a listener to the show, uh, sort of pitched this idea, which hint, hint, listeners, if you want to pitch us a, a good enough idea, we'll certainly not only entertain it, but uh, maybe even take you up on it. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, it's always a pleasure to have Omer Muzaffar back on. It's long ago. Uh, I can sit up. And it's great because we are actually sitting across from you. Typically in the past, we've had you on. I think this is your fourth appearance, if you can believe that. Yeah. I think it's usually <laughs> talking about Star Wars or evil people. So it's the, yeah. yeah. There you go. There you go. But Maybe uh, as a bonus, we'll talk yeah. about Star Wars. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, I'm going to defer to either of you to sort of start us off on where we want how, or how we want to frame this conversation. Well, um, thank you so much, uh, Pervez and Omar. I'm, um, I'm a big fan of your podcast and uh, really is an honor uh, uh, that you're able to come here uh, via um, guests at my house. And Omar Muzaffar, Professor Muzaffar, <laughs> uh, again, it's an, always an honor to collaborate with you and um, discuss such, a, um, such an important topic palliative care, what that means, and why it's so critical to have these discussions in our in our communities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it is, it's definitely important. I mean, uh, I have people very near and dear to me that are getting older. And I've seen a range of responses. I've seen folks who are very willing to have these conversations and talk about death. I've also seen the opposite. I've seen people very near and dear to me who do not want to even talk about any of this stuff at all Mm -hmm. anything negative anything scary anything emotional don't talk about it pretend it doesn't put your head in the sand 
It's so I, I think there's work to be done. I think it's less denial, and actually, this is maybe a question for you, Omar, uh, Professor Muzaffar. Is perhaps, and I'm going to limit it to limit this generalization to people from the subcontinent, but maybe it extends beyond that. Which is, uh, there's almost this thing within our tradition where, or culture, where we don't like to talk about bad things, and mm -hmm. certainly talking about death is a big no-no mm -hmm. um, because there's like this notion of the. I'm going to translate it as the black tongue, the mm -hmm. Gali Zaban. Like, don't, don't, don't mention death because mm -hmm. you never know. Angels are saying, I mean, that, like, mm -hmm. it, it, I think it comes from a good place. But I think that leads to the kind of, I think, phenomenon that Omar is talking about, where mm -hmm. e even though it's an undeniable part of life, let's not even talk about it because it's, it's a bad omen. Yeah, uh, I would agree. Uh, if we speak about many of our subcultures and speak about a greater society, I mean, death is where the rubber hits the road, right? Everything you believe mm. gets illustrated um, in, in the context of death, whether it's your own death or the death of your loved one. And that's when you really discover for yourself what you do believe versus what you have in your imagination. Uh, absolutely. And so, uh, Omar and Sada, relate to your point, uh, you know, I've taught all ages and the older that the crowd is, uh, they don't want to talk even about the Day of Judgment. So let's say I have students that are in junior high, they love talking about heaven and hell. They love, talk, love talking about destruction. Uh, when I have students that are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, the last thing they want to discuss is, is heaven and hell, the Day of Judgment, uh, consistently. That's really interesting. So it's not... It's, it's related to their age and really essentially like how arm's length the reality of it, mm -hmm. not so much a cultural thing, mm -hmm. or is it also a cultural thing? Well, I think uh, uh, that's one aspect of it. Another aspect of it, when we're speaking uh, about our own parents, uh, <clears throat> I mean, what a profound experience it is to, to lose a loved one, uh, especially uh, a parent. And so I think that alone people just don't even want to uh, imagine and uh, don't want to face if they don't have to. Mm -hmm. My my father uh, had a heart attack uh, about a year ago. And what's interesting is that a week before the heart attack, watching his, his decline physically, uh, cognitively and such, and he's still active, mashallah, now. Um, but, uh, a, you know, a week, what turned out to be a week before the heart attack, I thought we didn't have much more than a year with him. Um, and... And so I was facing a lot of these questions uh, back then and earlier, just yeah. looking at both of my parents and, and their decline. Yeah. And facing those hard questions nobody wants to face. That's I right. mean, in terms of, of uh, 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 Dr. Ansari, uh, 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 in terms of the work that you do, a lot of it is really related to people that are um, facing the end of life, right? Yes, and, and uh, Omar, I'm, I'm glad you... Um mentioned um, end of life with palliative care because um, that is a great um, uh, differentiation I want to make. It's not, let's just say, it's um, very common for people to associate palliative care with end of life. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's a great opportunity to maybe delve deeper into what is palliative care. Thank yeah. you. Let's define yeah. it. Right. Let's define listeners. it first because very very often uh you when you even when you google palliative care you'll see palliative care associated with hospice and when we mention hospice uh, we call it the h word and the h word uh, has a lot of negative connotations so uh maybe it would help to define what is palliative medicine what is palliative you to care? define what is hospice too i mean <laughs> we can right. definitely go there yeah, yeah. we're getting so, really reductive here but that's fine that's, <laughs> that's okay fine. and and here's here's just my understanding of it and you can maybe yes. define it by through like i'm going to explain what a, what a layman might be understanding and then you can correct it and then do, and, and define it. as you approach death what are all the things you need to think about so that things are taken care of okay yeah so it could be my understanding is it could be like organ donor donation sure. it could be burial process okay and so forth and i don't know if like Will, wills and will, whatnot come into will it, and trust. Okay, but, but you tell me. Okay. Pervis, yeah. you want to give it a shot? <laughs> uh, I was going to say the same thing. In fact, I think I made that same, maybe it's not an error, but certainly associating palliative care pa palliative care with uh, with end of life. Right. As if those two terms are interchangeable. Correct. So I'm almost waiting for you to Absolutely. correct my this ignorance. Is, uh, what a great opportunity. Uh, so palliative medicine or palliative care uh, is a recognized subspecialty 
um, within in the United States healthcare system and in the world where you're offering supportive care with patients with a serious illness. You could be at the beginnings of a serious illness, yeah. or you could be in the throngs of it, or you could be, as, as you were alluding to earlier, you could be at the end stage of a serious illness. And I, I, I say, we say serious illness purposely because uh, we're not just limited to cancer uh, because people usually think, oh, palliative care, cancer, death. Uh, but a serious illness could be advanced heart failure. Mm -hmm. It could be advanced kidney disease. It could be advanced lung disease and the many different subtypes that would be within those categories. What about, um, I, you know, something like Alzheimer's? Oh, absolutely. Or Parkinson's. Thank you. Yeah. Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. uh, Parkinson's. So any, any illness that's not curable right. and pro pro um, is imposing a burden. And palliative medicine is there to offer symptom relief mm. and supportive care, not just treating pain symptoms, but other symptoms like nausea, vomiting, depression, anxiety, uh, restlessness, um, all the symptoms that come with a serious illness, palliative medicine experts are there to manage that mm. with an interdisciplinary team, chaplains, mm -hmm. as you know, Omer, advanced practice nurses, and also it's always in collaboration with other physicians. Mm -hmm. so, so right there, uh, with regards to other physicians, what, what training do you, did you go through that led you into? Right. Yeah. yeah, and more so than training, I'm really curious how you got into the specialization right um you know well th th that right. is my question is it a specialization like you do a residency or a fellowship in uh palliative care or is it something like you're a pathologist and you and you know this becomes kind of the area you choose yeah so i i will answer that question but i, d yeah. I forgot to mention one more thing sure sure palliative care can be also involved with symptom management even say with um say cancers that you know you could cure mm. So you have a you have a patient with um, lymphoma, oh, which so. is a blood cell yeah. disorder, Sorry. and you know that that lymphoma has a good chance for being cured. But while the patient is undergoing treatment for that lymphoma, there is significant symptom burden mm -hmm. of nausea, vomiting, pain, distress. Oh. So the palliative care physician and the palliative care team can partner with oncology, and to help the patient and the family get through uh, this serious illness. So it's not just end of life right. and it's not just near the end but it's partnering with the uh, patient and the family through the through the tra trajectory mm. of uh, the illness so not uh, the, where, where the diagnosis is terminal necessarily mm -hmm. the, the diagnosis could be positive like the prognosis could be good and to help manage some of the burden of the symptoms like you said yeah it feels Correct. like it feels like it's bringing a lot of the compassion to the, the illness throughout the process. Yeah, we hope that everybody's compassionate. Yeah, uh, we, we we add a little flavor to it. Yes, <laughs> so, but uh, so this seems to be uh, if we're focusing on symptom relief, then this would be in contrast to curative uh, care. Mm -hmm. Meaning, and I'm just throwing out that word that one is trying to get rid of the disease, and what you're speaking about is is the well being of the person. Yeah, so I will say that the, in internal medicine and medicine. Right, um, and I'll get to my background, and sure. I, I didn't forget, Pervez, yeah. that um, there's very few things in medicine that can be cured. Mm. You know, you cannot really cure diabetes, uh, although there are some people that can overcome it, uh, but you can't really cure hypertension, mm -hmm. or uh, when kidney disease gets worse, like, you know, your kidneys start failing. There are certain diseases, uh, or dementia, uh, uh, Omar, that you were mentioning. So Omar Ansari yeah. was mentioning. Uh, there are two Omars in this room right now. <laughs> and two um, Ansaris, yeah. But <laughs> as dementia gets worse, the level of palliative support, the intensity of palliative support will increase as the disease progresses, right? So with a cancer patient that I may be involved with some symptom management, and maybe as the, if the disease progresses, then the conversations may change, mm -hmm. that we're in a different place now, mm -hmm. that maybe we need to um, ensure that your advanced directives, and we'll talk about that later, are filled out, that who is your healthcare power of attorney, 
uh, who, do you, who can speak for you if you're not able to speak and make healthcare decisions on your own? Which, by the way, is not even a palliative concept, right? To your point, yeah, I think you had mentioned earlier about um, advanced directives and um, what your wishes are at end of life. Mm -hmm. That is actually, um, we would not even consider that to be a palliative expertise. That is something that everyone should be talking about in their primary care offices about who their power of attorney is and who should they name as their health care power of attorney, uh, living wills, advanced directives, because you could not have a serious illness and, God forbid, get into a major car accident. Mm -hmm. And I can share lots of stories about, um, in regards of age, about devastating uh, traumas, uh, with, and no one talked about what the wishes would be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, and again, for speaking <clears throat> as, as another lay person, that uh, when you're speaking about advanced directives, power of attorney, you're basically saying, <clears throat> in the event that these issues come up, these tragedies happen, you want to make sure you have all those things figured out, that someone might have to make a decision for you. That is correct. Yeah. And every healthy person out there, and Omar, that's to your point about not wanting to have these conversations mm -hmm. at the dinner table, couples, spouses families, parents, irregardless of age, need to discuss or should be discussing <clears throat> what's an advanced directive, what is a living will, and Burbiz, you're an attorney, so uh, you're, you understand these concepts, right? And having those papers ready, irregardless of an illness. Now, when you, God forbid, get a serious illness, those issues are magnified even more. The importance mm -hmm. of those are even magnified even more. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, no, this, this is uh, making it very clear. So yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. No, I really do. Um, you were going to mention background. Yeah, that's yes, right. that's right. <clears throat> so I because uh, I been... do have a follow up question that I think will lend itself to uh, I think where someone like Omer in his background would get involved. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. Sorry, Professor Muzaffar. Just Professor Omer Bai. Okay, Omer Bai. There yeah, you go. Yeah. Because Omer Ansari is definitely not Omer Bai because <laughs> he's younger than me. So yeah, there you go. Um, right back to so I've been practicing for uh, a bit now. I finished residency in 2004 in internal medicine, and in 2006, when I had my first job um, out of training as a hospitalist. So I'm primarily a hospitalist, meaning I'm an internal medicine doctor that uh, maintains um, their practice in the hospital. Uh, my former boss said, "Hey, um, I think you'd be really good at palliative care." And I made the um, um, erroneous uh, uh, statement, oh, is that hospice? <laughs> uh, so clearly what I'm preaching now, I didn't know in 2006 or, <laughs> and even as a trained physician, right? Well, so, I appreciate you making us not feel so bad then. Because, there you yeah, go. Yeah, there you are, a trained physician. Yeah, I said, oh, palliative care uh, is hospice. There you go. And my medical students and my colleagues still uh, continue very seasoned, attendings or novice medical students, we are still making that mm. connotation. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. Um, part of that is because, so in one of my talks I give, I say, when you say something is, when you say something is not something, it becomes that something. I'll explain. When you say palliative care is not hospice, right? You just made the connotation there from a psychological standpoint. So yeah. we as a society are trying to, um, um, revamp the definition of how we explain things. So in our definitions of palliative care, we're not at all mentioning hospice. Good point. Because once you say something is not something, that's all something. Game over. Yeah, that's right. That's good. Right? Great point. Yeah, Great Muslims point. are not terrorists. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah. 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 Uh, correct. Mm -hmm. That's another example I use mm -hmm. um, uh, sometimes with colleagues. Um, so in 2006, I started practicing palliative medicine, I got grandfathered in. So in 2006, I took the academy boards, and then in 2008, it became a specialty. And I took the uh, boards under the American Board of Internal Medicine. I had enough hours put in where I was grandfathered in. Uh, and after 2008, um, you had to do a fellowship. So I have not done a fellowship, but now any uh, physician who wants to practice palliative medicine has to do a fellowship after their primary residency. So in palliative medicine, you could be ER doctor, you could be family medicine, 
internal medicine. You could be a surgeon. You could even be a pathologist and uh, do a fellowship in, um, in palliative care. So the fact that, or and you know, it's possible that this happens all the time, but the fact that they recently, or you know, in the last few years, sort of, you know, adjusted the requirements in order to be a board certified physician in palliative care, does that mean that even the medical field hadn't fully understood or appreciated this as its own specialization? I say that maybe by way of analogy, I think, for example, now addiction medicine, Correct. Uh, I know a physician who's in addiction medicine, but, um, you know, I know that was something that was in the last few years, uh, in terms of being a specialization in and of itself. So I think palliative medicine is one of those, um, fields that there was a big push to become a specialty because before that it was not. And, uh, there was this. I, I think a false uh, assumption that, well, everybody should be able to do palliative care. Mm, yeah. Because what really we're talking about is communication, being adept at having very tough conversations in a very, um, very stressful, very intense situations. And then there is a symptom management, which I think uh, with opioids and prescribing, um, it's not as easy as it used to be, uh, and all the different arrays of medic pharmacology that's out there for managing symptoms, that it made sense that palliative medicine became a specialty. Got it. Now, having said that, it um, making it fellowship only, where you can be board certified, it, it does decrease the pool of palliative care experts in the country, because about 50% of the current palliative care workforce is are the ones that are grandfathered in so at my young age of 48 about 20 years from now when our cohort we retire uh we worry that there's gonna be a big shortage mm -hmm. because when you only mm -hmm. have fellowship trained palliative care doctors out there uh and you take out the grand you take out the mechanism of uh grandfathering meaning uh for those uh uh not in the medical field grandfathering is you are allowed to do a specialty because you got involved at a time when it was not a specialty yeah. and you yeah. proved yourself so you're okay to practice. Mm -hmm. Is got there it. is there a component here or is there maybe a reason why the field is growing because a lot of diseases where you, maybe you did you you didn't you didn't live that long once they showed up. Now people are living longer with diseases and so the field becomes more important because you have to treat it for a longer period of time. Is that yeah? Um, it's, it's sort of hard to die <laughs> in modern day medicine. You can always die another day. I'm oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> and I, I, I mean, we say that because modern medicine has become so complex that we can extend life um, easily or easier. Yeah. And what's right. missing in the conversation is what is the quality of life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? A lot of elderly patients tell me, Doc, these are not the golden years. I can't even get out of bed. Mm -hmm. Or I'm in a nursing home for sometimes a decade or longer, right? But modern medicine with medicines and technology and surgeries and everything has been able to extend life where historically we were not able to. So historically, the dying process was more natural and more um, accepted. Now we're having courses on death and dying and teaching medical students that uh, we need to talk about the dying process and we need to bring it to people's attention. And to your point, Professor Mazuffer and Omer, you know, people don't want to talk about it because we, we think we're just going to live forever and if we're lucky, we'll, somebody will find us and we'll die in our sleep. But it doesn't work that way right, right. in reality. If I could then, because something you mentioned earlier is what was the idea of, uh, of, of an interdisciplinary uh, sort of approach to palliative care. So when you mentioned that, someone like a, someone who offers pastoral care uh, is that something that would be involved? Or yes, someone like that would be involved? They are my best friends okay. uh, when I'm on right. service. Uh, okay. Our pastoral care, our social workers. Right. 
um, they are able to add that depth and that um, ability to connect with the patient and family and offer pastoral care, spiritual support, right. emotional support. Um, and also we're, we're not taking, or we haven't mentioned the fact that it's not just the patient, it's the patient's family that, that yes. oftentimes needs that. Yes, um, because you're treating the whole uh, unit. There you go. And, um, y- you know, uh, I can tell you that it's probably not a good idea to ignore the family. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, the family, uh, I'll, I'll back up a moment. So in my um, practice as a palliative care consultant and an internal medicine doctor, I am very inpatient focused, right? I don't see outpatients. I don't have a clinic. So inpatient palliative care is, to your point, Omar, very much about, oh, we're in really bad shape right now, or we've gone through three rounds of chemo, we're losing weight, we're frail, we can't even get out of bed, we're having nausea, vomiting, and things are just not in a good place. So um, my involvement in palliative medicine in the inpatient side is very intense and is closer to end of life, not necessarily, where I wish that we had more of these conversations upstream Mm -hmm. when patients uh, were healthier and families then would be able to, um, you know, connect the dots and and be better prepared. We have a saying that um, we hope for the best and we we prepare for the worst. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to, I want to maybe pivot the conversation just a bit and, t- and because I want to ask about kind of the religious mm-hmm. spiritual connection. Are there, like when we were talking about end of life, we know there's a lot of like questions, 50 questions, mm-hmm. right? Um, what are the, Omar, uh, Omar Bhai, what are kind of the considerations when you mm-hmm. talk about this topic? Where does like the where do the spiritual considerations come in? Yeah. Um, is because obviously there there probably is something about do we continue ex- try to ex- keep extending life? That's mm-hmm. like your macro consideration. But then even on an individual basis, there's probably some considerations as well. Mm-hmm. Not just providing support, but actually from like religious like fiqh and so forth. Sure. I mean, on the chaplaincy side or the Muslim chaplaincy side, uh, you have uh, a couple of streams of thought. One, of course, is Islamic law, Sharia, right? Uh, another is what we would call uh, ethics or bioethics. Uh, sharia obviously has you know over a thousand years of history behind it and thought, including matters related to what we're speaking about here. Bioethics, uh, in terms of Muslim bioethics, Islamic bioethics, um, it's still in its infancy. Uh, if we were to survey all of the journal articles and writings uh, on the topic, it's probably less than 300 uh, at this exact moment. If we had this conversation 10 years ago, it was probably less than 200. Um, it's a growing field. And so so ethics in general uh, would be adab or akhlaq uh, within, within the Islamic tradition. But to help make sense of first, how do those fit together? Think of sharia as the skeleton. Uh, this is uh, addressing the bare minimum, uh, the philosophical point uh, being, okay, what does the divine want? What is the divine order from us? Mm-hmm. And if we obey it, then we have in this world stability. And then in the next world, we have, inshallah, salvation. Uh, ethics, adab, akhlaq, is getting more into the realm of what we would speak about uh, al- along with the, 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 the topic of even manners. So let me give you a, a common situation in my office, um, um, distinguishing between sharia and, and ethics. Uh, those of you who are more familiar with Islamic law in terms of maqasid, the higher aims, that's getting more into the realm of, of ethics, but still a little bit different. But uh, I'll have four different students come to my office uh, with drinking problems. I mean, uh, people might be surprised that, you know, alcohol is a little bit consumed too much in our Muslim community, any community, but it's also there in our community. The first student, I might tell that person, stop drinking, because that is what will work, right? Uh, The second student, they already know they're not supposed to drink. And for them, I might have to tell them, you need to find a different set of friends, akin to the Hadith narration that we're all familiar with about the man who killed 99 people, goes to a monk, goes to a scholar, the scholar says, you have to get out of that town because it's making you crazy. The third person, I might tell them that you need to do more research on on what this is doing to you. 
Uh, the fourth person, and these are all real cases, the fourth person is a case I had two weeks ago uh, where I'm asking her, how many drinks can you limit yourself to? Can you limit yourself to four drinks um, when you go to, to a club? And so the point is, the Sharia is the same in all four of these cases, Yeah. right? Alcohol is haram in all four of these cases. Looking in, ca in the case of the maqasid, the higher aims, trying to preserve life, is it relevant, trying to preserve religion, so forth and so on. In some of those cases, absolutely yes. Uh, uh, and so now when we add the element of, of what we would call ethic, it's ethics, it's trying to figure out what is the best answer for that person in that moment. Right, and so uh, uh, bringing this back to Dr. Ansari, but even speaking uh, about, I gave the example of my my father. I was having some long discussions with a different friend of mine, uh, who's a physician, and he was speaking about his father who had passed away. May Allah's mercy be upon him and okay. all those who've passed away. That uh, his sisters uh, wanted to uh, make their father, their ailing father, take every single medicine possible, um, as though they could eradicate this disease. Uh, whereas he, the physician, who also, not professionally in terms of palliative care, but um, he's he's worked in that universe, he said, no, why don't you let him live the life he wants to live at this point, yeah. right? So for example, you know, my father, he, for breakfast, he loves Nihari. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not good for your health. And for those of you who are not familiar with what Nihari is, I encourage you to, to research it and consume as much as you can. Um, but, <laughs> but the basic point being, we could restrict that from him uh, for the purpose of health. Right. And it's going to make him miserable. Yeah. Right. Or we could let him have his, his small amount of Nihari. Um, and that helps him, you know, with the rest of his day. I, I can, I can just relate to that with a, a yeah. parent with diabetes. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'm like, here, here, here's a bowl of ice cream. Cause it's going to make, make you happy. And mm -hmm. other times I'm like, you're not touching, touching that space. Like, it's that literally that back and forth. You just, no. uh, that's a, yeah, go yeah. back and forth. No, right? I really appreciate it. Sorry. Are you, yeah. are you I mean, I mean, the uh, if well, I'll, why don't you make your your point? I, it's not a point. It's just a question because I, I I really appreciate the way you just just sort of navigated that. But I, I guess um, when uh, Dr. Ansari mentioned the uh, idea of quality of life, mm -hmm. it it made me think of the age sort of age old you know uh, discussion that we have often in Muslim circles around the idea that well, your days mm -hmm. are are you know Allah has written for you your life span. And the way I sort of navigate that conversation for people that ask me around those issues, I generally make the distinction between, well, you may not increase the days you have that remain, but you will increase the quality of life. So yeah. hence, take care of yourself, take mm -hmm. care of your health, get the care you need. Because yes, your days are destined and your days are uh, are known and finite, but the quality of life is an argument or is a, is a, is a component that you can actually control. Mm -hmm. Is that how in your pastoral would, care? Uh, absolutely. I think the fact that our life is set uh, uh, overall is far more of a relief than a burden, right? And so... Please explain. Yeah, yeah that's a beautiful so, point. So uh, I have a friend of mine whose uh, whose brother passed away, uh, uh, essentially from from an overdose. Right, the brother was probably under the age of thirty, mm -hmm. and one of the conversations that I was having with him because I have that level of relationship with him, um, he was regretting I should have done this, I should have done that. The thing that we all do, all right? Mm -hmm. If only I said did this. If only I spent mm -hmm. more time. And then I asked him very point blank because I could. Uh, if you did all of those things, would he be here today? Mm. And he said, no. Yeah. Right? right now, that is not right. something you tell a person at the moment that, you know, that passing is happening, but as a way to cope, uh, absolutely. Okay. If we add the element of salvation to this, uh, then I'm also, uh, looking at what from my assessment is best for this person, including in the context of, of their medical treatment, Right. And this is going to sound very cold, but hopefully the point will, will make sense. Uh, so we all understand that, okay, if Allah gives you wealth, it does not mean automatically he's happy with you. If he gives you suffering, it does not mean that he's unhappy with you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but if he's given you wealth, uh, the purpose is for you to get closer to Allah. If he's given you suffering, the purpose is for you to get closer to Allah. There are some of us who respond more to suffering, 
right? That if I'm in need, if I'm in pain, then I turn to Allah. If I'm in loss, I turn to Allah. And there's some of us who respond more to, to uh, ease, mm. that if Allah gives me ease, then it's easier for me to turn to Allah. If I have suffering, then I turn away. And the flip side, and so even with a person facing very serious health conditions, for that person, in my capacity, uh, I'm trying to evaluate what is better for that person in that moment. Yeah. Uh, is it the pain or is it the relief? Likewise for the family members. And I mean, uh, when you're, uh, Dr. Ansari, when you're, when you're, you know, having the discussions with, with chaplains and other physicians, uh, what are some of the things that you're looking at you know, in this process? So, uh, in great discussion and, um, you know, the, uh, spiritual and the existential crises that we see, um, and we're going to pivot to end of life if, since we're there right now, mm -hmm. right? I think we've made it clear that palliative care is not end of life. But mm -hmm. for the sake of this discussion right now, uh, I have found that regardless of uh, faith, that spiritual distress and uh, I would say what we call existential crises uh, happen. That is why we always ask, is there a clergy or chaplain or priest or imam or whatever deity a person follows, whatever their spiritual support may be? Because mm -hmm. there's a difference in spirituality and religiosity. And I like to focus on the spiritual uh, aspects of that. That um, are they being taken care of? Are their needs being met from a spiritual standpoint? Right? At end of life. Mm -hmm. Um, so that gets very tricky to navigate if that patient and the family feel that, um, I am obligated to keep pushing on, even though I know this is terrible for my quality of life and increasing my symptom burden. Mm -hmm. And so what we have, um, been having we, we have to navigate as palliative care physicians is how do i respect your belief that a miracle will happen like patients say families say i believe in a miracle yeah. and a miracle will happen doctor and you can't stop that miracle from happening yeah. and i say thank you for sharing and i'm hoping for a miracle also while we're waiting for that miracle to happen what can we do to support you and get you to feel better? Because mm. who doesn't want to feel better? Mm -hmm. right. And even just as a side note here, the, what I'm, the way I'm thinking about that is, it's not really like it's, it's, it seems like it would be consensus that feeling better is a good thing. But there is a limit to the idea of how, how much you're going to fight to extend life. Because that's not... While it's human nature, and it's, a, it's even from a religious point of view, you, like you should fight for life. We're not like a, in a situation where you want to live forever, and that's your end goal. Like you know, how long can I live? Period. That's the end goal, right? There's a difference, even Islamically, between the idea in the value of quality of life, which is versus like the goal of extending life. So, how about if I take a gander at that mm -hmm. from a physician standpoint, and then I would love Professor Mazafar to talk about the. Um, mm -hmm spiritual aspects of that so i as a physician cannot impose my values and what i perceive to be a quality of life on a patient or family so there's a difference between um so we talk about futility in medicine and so there's quantitative futility where your blood pressure is top number we call it systolic is Six zero sixty. I am not going to give you your blood pressure medication because your blood pressure is 60. I'm only going to cause harm. Okay? It is futile to give you your blood pressure medication right now. It's a very, like, very mm -hmm. um, simple analogy. Or, um, actually, let me, get, let me give a, a more um, pertinent example. We get, as a tertiary care center, we get patients who come here... Um, come to our institution as a last resort. I went to X, Y, and Z hospital, and they told me that they, quote, can't do anything for me, unquote. So I want the chemotherapy. 
uh, th the other day, <clears throat> I had a patient with a terrible um, cancer of the face, and he was told by a neighboring institution uh, that they cannot offer him any advanced therapies, chemotherapy, radiation. So he came to our emergency room, uh, could barely swallow. The, 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 the tumor on the face was enormous. I still have that uh, visual in my, in my head. And did, we talked to him. Did the neighboring institution deny, you know, sort of therapeutics or what have you because it was, it was, the, it again, was going back to the what they call futility? quantitative futility. There you go. Okay. So that is quantitative futility. Sure, sure. So we said the same thing. Okay. We said, we actually agree with uh, the neighboring institution. There are neighboring competition, actually, uh, in the Chicago area. And we said, you know, we know them. Uh, we've actually talked to them and we agree that uh, giving you chemotherapy is only going to cause harm. So things got a little dicey. So, of course, they called the palliative care consultant to save, um, to save the day and to uh, ease, you know, help with the communication. Because also another thing that we do is we also support the prime, the, you know, the, that primary team taking care of the patient. Uh, and sometimes the patients and families need an extra set of eyes and ears to have that communication. So we said, uh, we're very sorry that we're in this situation, but we cannot give any chemotherapy or radiation. Uh, that is only going to cause harm. You're entitled to another opinion at another institution. Um, <clears throat> so now we're dealing with a patient that has having complications from this huge mass, bleeding and so many other things going on. He's not doing well. So this is where the, the hospital-based palliative conversation goes. We can keep doing these maneuvers to um, um, fight the complications. Blood thinners, and you're bleeding, we give you blood, but you need a blood thinner because you have a blood clot, because you have cancer. The whole physiology is super complex. I don't want to bore you guys. But we could keep going. Or we could take a route of focusing on your comfort and ensuring your quality of life is as best as we can make it. So we ask, what is important to you? So this is where the term, uh, I, I, I said there are two types of futility. So I mentioned quantitative. So what I just mentioned, that is quantitative futility. I am not, we are not going to give you chemotherapy, right? Uh, there's Then there's qualitative futility. And qualitative futility, I cannot make a judgment on. I think that it was qualitative futility to keep treating this patient with measures that we know are not going to solve the underlying problem. Mm -hmm. But I cannot impose that, uh, those, cause those are my values and preferences mm -hmm. onto a patient and family. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, it's That's a two pronged. It's a really a two pronged thought process. It's the, it's the quantitative what you're using your expertise as a, as a medical professional and you're making a judgment call to not cause harm. And then there's a qualitative side, depending on how the family or the patient want to approach that balance. You're helping com through communication and partnership, providing additional medical consulting. Well, that's mm -hmm. what I was going to say. Like, I, I think the qualitative is where you would bring in someone mm -hmm. like Omar, uh, Professor Mozaffar. So, Omar um, <laughs> yeah. So the qualitative would be the collaboration of the palliative care physician and the and chaplaincy and social mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, so we have our multidisciplinary approach because the thing is that you can never come in with an agenda, right? I could think all I want about how crazy it may sound to keep doing these treatments on this patient with a terminal condition. Mm -hmm. But, uh, we have to learn as physicians and providers and healthcare team is to step back, uh, have that conversation but allow the patient and family to really talk more and I should be talking less and elicit values and preferences from, mm. from that conversation. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if we frame the same scenario from, from an Islamic law perspective, uh, even some of the vocabulary doctrines, uh, doctrines are used is, is identical. Like if we were to summarize the entirety of Islamic law into one sentence, it's 
uh, removal of harm and promotion of benefit. And if we were to try to reduce that even further, it's removal of harm, right? And then I made a reference to uh, to the, the, the higher aims. Uh, uh, it is the physician who is going to be determining, according to the best of their assessment, what is the, uh, the likelihood that life is going to be sustained here, right? And then, uh, then I'd be looking at, all right, what about the other elements now? Uh, in terms of this person and the relationship with the divine, uh, what is it that they need to hear? And then likewise for the family member, uh, what is it that they need to hear to direct them to something both in terms of true reality, but also in terms of something that is much more compassionate for them, mm. right? And so, uh, not to be too reductive here, imagine Dr. Ansari, he's the mechanic telling you, okay, here's, here's what's going to happen if we take these steps, and I'm basically the, 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 the soft sponge or the, 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 the warm blanket to, to help make that, uh, the news palatable. And, and so, so the point being then that uh, in terms of the shari'i tools, uh, it can take you so far, but you're still going to have to defer to the physician. Uh, who is the expert telling you exactly what's going to happen. Some Islamic scholars will say you want to get answers from a Muslim physician. Um, this is not a fatwa that I'm giving. I'm of the opinion that uh, if they're coming from the same training, uh, then the same uh, they're going to give you the same uh, data analysis, uh, so to speak. But having said that, um, uh, going back into this issue of, of, uh, of bioethics uh, uh, in particular, uh, one of the, the really, really important points I think we all need to take from, from Dr. Ansari's comments is that our common approach, once again, and this is repeating and sort of summarizing what's been said, what the common approach is, if I have a loved one who is very sick, I want them to live as long as possible, no matter what it does to them, right? Uh, that's a problem in my spirituality. It's not the problem in the patient's spirituality, right? Would yeah. you, I'm sorry, yeah. because I, even when you mentioned bioethics earlier, I thought about this. Uh, would you make a distinction between bioethics and medical ethics, or are we using those terms interchangeably? And if we're not, or if we are, can you define bioethics? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so when we get into the particulars, yeah, there, there are a few differences. So okay. medical ethics uh, would include the physician, uh, the honesty and the integrity of the physician, right? So. Okay. Uh, it's very easy for a physician to prescribe treatments that are probably not the best, but they're not going to be the worst, but they will line up the pocketbooks of the physicians, right? right. And so that would be more in the realm of medical ethics. Mm. So bioethics is more going to be focused a bit on, on uh, within Islamic bioethics, through uh, uh, an Islamic lens, uh, what do we have to say about all the different elements of the experience um, of the patient-doctor relationship, right? Got it. Uh, and and so you can see that these are circles that do overlap with each other, right? right? right. Yeah, and uh, but the the basic point being that uh, uh, with the patient, with the family, my job is through compassion to steer them towards their relationship with the divine, not because that's what religion is, uh, but because this is also going to be the most compassionate answer for them, right? And I mean, I've been in every single type of household. Um, uh, social, economic, religious, and without disrespect to any other tradition, I will say that Muslims and Christians tend to do the best in dealing with these types of issues. Muslims and Christians? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Versus? Uh, let's say at the other end of the spectrum, with no disrespect to anybody in particular, atheists tend to do the worst. Right? Now, walk through the whole process. Uh, if we're speaking of the whole picture that even a half-hearted Muslim or Christian has, there is a belief that there is something bigger. Mm -hmm. Right? If I'm taking my atheism to its full conclusion, what is the end result? Mm -hmm. I'm going to be fertilizer, right? And if I take ownership of that, then this person's passing, this person's suffering is, is essentially about the worst that you can have, right. right? If I'm looking from the perspective that Allah does not give me a burden that I cannot handle, that Allah does not give me suffering except that he removes sins from my life, it's a much more compassionate outlook on life itself. You know, even if we were to argue that all this was just made up, uh, I don't know how people without belief make it through these huge challenges in life. Are you deliberately excluding people with a Jewish well, background? I'm saying uh, Jews, in my experience, as a collective, do as well as, if not better than everybody else, right? Because uh, I think it's a history of surviving. 
right? A history of... of oh, interesting. I thought you were going to say because of what, you know, Jewish theology says about the afterlife. I think uh, I'm speaking more anecdotally mm. in terms of... Mm. Uh, I think of, I mean, theology, there's part of theology that works in a vacuum. Uh, much theology works in relationship with how, how you know, life experiences take place. Usually the theology comes later after, mm. let's say, the political event or, or the social event and such. I mean, that's a whole conversation on its own. Fascinating. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, yeah. My, anecdotally, uh, yeah. Muslims and Christians and people religion in general, Muslims and Christians tend to do much better in these struggles. But I also want to draw attention to a very important point that uh, Dr. Ansari made about the difference between religiosity and spirituality. Okay. Uh, what I heard from that, and you can correct me, um, mm -hmm. The religiosity is the person who who claims belief fulfills all the 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 checks uh, the check boxes of belief. They make their prayers in our context. They fast, so forth and so on. But when they get hit with a test, it all goes out the window. And the spiritual is a person who's internalized some of the fundamental themes, right, about how life operates. That life has uh, uh, happy experiences. Life has difficult experiences. And then we, we persevere through those with gratitude, with suffering, and you know, with, with uh, perseverance and so forth and so on. Is that somewhere in the universe of what you were speaking about? Because I'd say the spirituals, I'm defining it, do much better in these types of struggles. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, so thank you for that. I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah. And no, I, I think um, the, the religiosity I find causes, um, just, I'm just saying as a practitioner who has seen lots and lots of patients when the religiosity takes over, there seems to be significantly more um, distress, uh, anxiety, and less willingness to take a more comfort route, uh, take less of a palliative route, mm -hmm. so Got to speak. Right. Because then the religiosity takes over. And while, you know, I may not agree with it, as a practitioner, I have to respect that. Mm -hmm. So the dilemma that I'm in, and a lot of physicians are in, is, um, well, I know that your religion doesn't say that, whether it's Catholicism, mm -hmm. Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism. Sure. Um, but how do you, and how to maneuver that is very challenging, because mm -hmm. you see this patient going through so much distress, um, but the family, because usually by then the patient may be not be able to have a conversation, but the family is, to your point, professor, was pushing, right, their beliefs onto the patient mm -hmm. and then using religion as the uh, scapegoat. Mm -hmm. it's, so, uh, they don't realize that it's the scapegoat. Uh, so you, if you exactly could talk about that. Yeah, I mean, and as you yeah, talk about that, I, I'm, I'm curious if, because it seems like you've thought this through, and I know it's not exactly... Uh, the topic that we're talking about. However, I, I, I can't help but I think pause and, and, and offer. Yeah, apologies for derailing. Things. No, 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 yeah, you no, didn't no. at all. Not at all. <laughs> is in the vernacular of our tradition, then would you say that religiosity is Islam mm -hmm. and spirituality is Iman? Uh, I think it works. I'm not uh, saying it's going to be clean, yeah, yeah, clean but cut. It, but and, and well, if we again put in like just simple real life examples, uh, <clears throat> let's say you have a loved one who is going through a very, very serious uh, health uh, situation for which Dr. Ansari and, and his team are addressing uh, the situation. What is better for you? That I walk in and I start quoting passages of the Quran, if I start quoting Hadith, or if I'm sitting there next to you, right? Giving you company uh, and having discussion with you that is actually informed by the deen, informed by Quran Hadith, without quoting the passages, uh, but in the way that the Prophet, peace be upon him, would visit the people who've lost loved ones, or the famous story of the Prophet talking to the young boy who had his little pet bird, and he's saying to, you know, the bird died, and he's talking to the little boy, what happened to your bird, right? And so uh, you are embodying the Islam without invoking it, right? I mean, you're in embodying the way of the Prophet, peace be upon him, with people who are going through these huge struggles. And so that would be the, the religiosity in the sense that when you're speaking about the Islam, it would be the outward. And, and yeah. where areas or, or questions around fiqh and mm -hmm. permissibility and impermissibility can yeah. emerge. Yeah. Whereas yeah. The, the spiritual or the iman component is... I mean, know. another way to, uh, to even think about this without going too far, but I'll also bring it back, 
is a lot of the ways we imagine our Islam. You know, I mentioned that, you know, think of, of Sharia, think of fiqh as, as the skeleton. So this is what's holding the whole body together, right? I mean, doctor, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. But uh, uh, so if you remove that, then the body starts falling apart, right? Uh, but it is only the skeleton, okay? It is not all of the organs and it is not the person that is the, the, the conglomeration of all these organs and such. Mm. And so think of the dean as the whole package, right? And where do you actually find a person's dean? Uh, one element is their relationship with the divine, which should be their prayers, their fasting, so forth and so on. But aside from that, it's how do they conduct themselves with each other? So when the prophet, peace be upon him, says, I did not come except to perfect character, where do you show your character? It's in how you conduct yourself with people right? You show your Islam in your relationships. Mm. And so one of the essences that I, that, uh, that is of my work, but I'm also hearing of Dr. in Dr. Ansari's work is literally, it's the relationship that you're, that you're addressing here. You're taking the person, not as a body with symptoms, uh, but as a person and treating that person as a person, you're treating the family as, as, as people to find out what is best for them in the, in the, in this uh, given moment. Yeah. I mean, so, so listening, uh, Dr. Ansari, to what you're saying, uh, w one thing that I'm imagining here is theoretically, if we're speaking about uh, the comfort of the patient, it's you're potentially saying, although you said about chemotherapy, that you may not give a treatment to a person. And if we walk that to, through its full conclusion, then the person passes away, the family blames you for causing the death. Is this, a, is this a thing with uh, It's care? never happened. Uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, and I think that's a really important question you're bringing up. There's a lot more literature on the benefits of palliative care now versus, you know, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the facts are that it, when you look at what we call meta-analyses and you look at all the literature out there and you survey patients and families, um, there's improved pain, improved symptom distress. There's improved quality of life by actually we can measure quality of life scores. And the, there are studies that look at uh, those who had a palliative consult for the same diagnosis and those who didn't. There was a landmark study in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is our um, premier internal medicine journal, who took patients who had metastatic or spread lung cancer at the, at the time of diagnosis. They already were had cancer that was spread. And they had the palliative care arm along with oncology care and the arm without palliative care and oncology care. The There was actually a survival benefit of 2.3 months in the palliative care with oncology arm than in the oncology arm. I'm going to repeat that again, 2.3 mm -hmm. month survival benefit. And with a metastatic, um, with a diagnosis of metastatic cancer, lung cancer, that is significant. And they also found that those patients in the palliative care arm had improved quality of life, their uh, symptoms Symptom management, symptom scores were improved. What does that mean? Systems. Uh, so they had less degree, less uh, rates of depression, anxiety, uh, and nice. actually, you lived a little bit longer. Hmm. So we actually are saying that you may have an improvement in mortality with a palliative approach. And I'll make a very simple example. Chemotherapy is generally not very good to your body, hmm. right? We can all, uh, you know, agree upon I mean, that. It's a, it's a nuclear bomb to the system. Um. So if you withhold chemotherapy and you focus on palliation and supportive care, you could improve the quality of life, n uh, decrease the number of hospitalizations that the patient may go through because you're not giving the chemotherapy. Wow. And have the patient live longer because you're, you're at home and you're not coming in and out of the hospital. Right. And I've seen this over and over again where the patients who opt for chemotherapy with a terminal condition, they just keep getting hospitalized and one complication after another. And their lives, if maybe shorter, but definitely their quality of life is not as good as a person who's at home who said, you know what, I don't want the chemotherapy. I've had the discussion with my all my doctors and I'm making a decision to take a more palliative and supportive approach in a terminal condition. You see? Yeah. yeah. So... so um, this is, go ahead. I, Cause I do have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Oh, um, so I, I lost my father in 2008, um, right here in Chicago. He was, um, on a list for a heart transplant. 
uh, from the University of Chicago, uh, but his symptoms had grown you know, so much worse that the doctors figured, well, we, we need to get him uh, some assistance right now, otherwise he's not even gonna make it to the, uh, until we find the right donor. Um, so they suggested what they call a bridge to transplant, which in the case of uh, his congestive heart failure uh, was uh, a left ventricle assistance device. And LVAD. LVAD, thank you. And so we opted for that approach, went to the hospital. Um, he had the surgery. The surgery itself was so complicated because of scar tissue from a bypass that he had eight years prior. Uh, he basically never got out of ICU after the, uh, oh, after the, uh, yeah. And uh, my mother, I remember days afterwards, I mean, she kept asking me, like, did we do the wrong thing? Mm. Like, did we make the wrong decision? And you saying that just sort of conjured back that I like those memories, because I remember telling mom, no, whatever was meant to happen, happened and, and so on. But I think to your point, would we have been better off? Again, I'm not asking you to comment on my father's situation mm -hmm. specifically, uh, nor am I trying to work out some trauma. I'm just saying in general, though, like in instances like that, is the patient better off just being at home and seeing what happens as opposed to doing these type of sort of, you know, elective procedures to, you know, try to, do you see what I'm saying? So, um, well, first of all, thank you for sharing um, uh, what's obviously very traumatic and uh, you never forget, right. never forget those uh, events. Um, you know, I can't comment on on that specifically, I mean, LVADs are put in and they are a bridge to transplant and it is appropriate. Um, I have an LVAD um, story uh, to share, which may answer your question very roundabout. Please. Um, so we're, we're, we do uh, palliative consultations on every LVAD impl impl implementation. Wow, I had no idea of even uh, asking this, the question. This was not would, around in yeah. 2008. Okay. okay. Um, it's very recent. And I remember uh, I met this lovely um, patient who uh, was with her family, and she was getting LVAD as a um, bridge to transplant. Okay. And uh, I said, you know, have you talked about advanced directives, and have you thought about living will, and uh, if you were to have a catastrophic complication like a stroke or bleeding, or you would get really sick, uh, what would your wishes be? And she said, you know, I never really thought about that. And here I'm thinking, mm -hmm. you know, my God, she's in our cardiac care unit. She's critically ill. She has a balloon pump, which is helping her right. pump her heart. And we're about to do an LVAD, and she hasn't had these discussions. So I said, look, I want you to, um, I'm not here to say do or don't do a LVAD. I think you're a good candidate for an LVAD, and I think you'll do well. This is me saying that. However, we don't know if, if a complication will happen. So I want you to hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Mm -hmm. And I had no, I, I just, okay, routine consult, you know, have the conversation, you know, I think she'll do well. And I get called like three weeks later, hey, we need you back. This patient didn't do well. Mm -hmm. And I still remember to this day, um, she was with it enough and she remembered me. And she said, Doc, I am so glad I had that conversation that you forced me to think and I know exactly what I want, and I know I'm not doing well, and I don't want this anymore, and I'm ready to go with God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Just by, you know, instigating that um, conversation. And similarly, um, you know, as we're talking about quality of life and, and uh, symptom burden, um, there's a story that comes to my mind of um, uh, a patient that I was uh, taking care of uh, with... Um, colon cancer, you know, he was running marathons. Age? And he, uh, young, like we're young, right, Pervis? Um, <laughs> early 50s. So a little bit running and marathons. he felt a little bit of abdominal pain after one marathon and mm. said, okay, get checked out. And he got diagnosed with um, metastatic colon cancer and went through very aggressive treatments, um, went to, got the best care he could. But at the end of the day, the cancer, you know, took over. And I had the uh, privilege of um, taking care of him, um, probably a year or so uh, before he died and listening to his life story and what he's done and having the privilege of going to his home when he was in the actively dying phase and when he said, I have fought really hard and I'm tired and I just, I want to be at peace. Mm. And thankfully, what an amazing family that young kids 
that uh, they paid attention to that yeah. and said, you know, you fought really hard. You're not giving up. So oftentimes people say, well, I don't want to give up. I said, we say, you're not. The disease has, is, has already spoken, right? That is now taking control. How can, what is important to you and how can we make you feel better and what's within our control? Yeah. And I always say the higher power, I always, um, as a physician, regardless of um, a person's faith background, I say, you know, uh, patients with them, patients always say, well, it's up to God, isn't it? And mm -hmm. I'll say, of course. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. always a higher power. Mm -hmm. And God has given us the responsibility to make sure that we're not causing harm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that... I can tell you guys countless stories. We'll be here all night, which you don't have time for. Uh, no, I appreciate on, it. on the value of listening and um, really, if if we're that vehicle that can bring peace, yeah, to a very, very traumatic and very stressful time, then I can feel good about myself. And mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, yeah, I, mean, I think. I oh, sorry, you, you're you're illustrating this point that just with the choice of communication of vocabulary of tone yeah how differently you've explained the entire thing you could have said to him you know here's here's a percentage of your body that has been devoured by by the by the disease and here's this and this and this and this and right. it would have been very cold and objective right. as opposed to you know the cancer is, is taking over you know and that changes the conversation so much and it changes the experience so much for the patient, for the family. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And, and, and I was just going to say that um, I know that palliative care we've learned is not just related to end of life, but I'm sure a lot of this, the your day-to-day -day work is related is. to end of life. And that's got to be very stressful at times. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you kind of, I mean, I'm sure being a doctor in general is stressful, but, but specific to dealing with end of life issues has its own level of stress. How do you how do you deal? How do you manage that? How do you how do you take care of yourself in that process? So, I mean, one thing to be fair, um, I am uh, a healthcare leader, so my clinical time is much less than it used to be. Mm -hmm. So that helps uh, the burnout. But burnout is real, and palliative care physicians have um, one of the highest rates of burnout mm -hmm. compared to other specialties. Mm -hmm. Dermatology is the one with the least amount of burnout, but they're. <laughs> They're really smart. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I would say, um, What's the you know, worst, like, it's the patient stories. Is, is the worst like oncology? I'm just curious. Do you know I mean? I don't ER. Know. ER. 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 Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, <clears throat> but I'll say um, when I'm practicing as an internal medicine doctor, I, I don't get many, um, oh, thank you so much. But time and time again, the level of gratitude that you get, and I'll, I'll share a story um, that will help Omar put it in perspective. I remember we were seeing a patient that oncology, I do believe, told this patient that there's no more chemotherapy that can offer and it's all supportive care. So they called us. He was having a very difficult time with it. A fairly young man, middle-aged, and he got mad. He got really mad at us when we broke the news. Again, that we were at a crossroads here. We can focus on your Sim we can focus on your quality of life and take a palliative approach, or we can um, continue facing these complications. And is you know, uh, he got really upset. It two days later, we had the courage to come back because he was he wasn't very kind to us. And he said, you know, I've been just staring at this ceiling for two days, and you guys are angels that have descended from heaven to support me and tell me the truth. And um, he started crying about um, the fact that we were able to, we call break bad news in a, to your Omar, to your point, in a compassionate manner, mm -hmm. speak the truth in, in a very difficult situation. So what gets me through, uh, this is a good segue, Professor Mazuffer, mm -hmm. from the spiritual standpoint. You know, everybody has their outlet. And, uh, and for me, it's faith and spirituality. I'm very humbled and honored to be in these situations. Um, I mean, I have, you know, done palliative consults on young moms who wanted to keep living. Why? Because they just want to hold their child in their in their body. They just want to hold their child 
as long as they can, even if it means they're going through this stress themselves. Wow. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And just to be able to be, have the privilege to be in that room, to be able to navigate these very tough situations, the thank yous and the, and the um, like lack of better words, the blessings that you get, keeps me going. And also, from a spiritual standpoint, it just keeps me honed in on um, the uh, fragility of life and that um, we, you know, we say every, live every day to its fullest, right? From a personal level, that allows me to... Um, Keep that in mind. Now, of course, I practice it. Hundred, no, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, we're all, we're all we're human. All, we're all works in progress. Exactly. We're all works in progress. So, you know, that Omar, that relates to, uh, I think, the biggest um, dilemma that palliative care uh, providers face is when families bring up the religion issue and um, say, "Well, this is not. This is against my religion." Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I think your question is exactly what I wanted to ask, which is around the issues of. I mean, what's sort of it's crass but pulling the plug mm -hmm. or active passive euthanasia and i imagine that's something that you advise sure. and you consult on and obviously in consultation with what the medical practitioner is telling you but at the end of the day though th those are conversations that i imagine at least the patient's families are coming to you mm -hmm. for guidance and i would say let's separate euthanasia from normal end of life sure. issues and we can talk about euthanasia sure. for sure yeah sure. Uh, okay. I mean, the, there are some aspects that overlap in terms of the Islamic law perspective. So, okay. so first, just to give you like the in, in simple lay terms, uh, you cannot uh, engage in steps that will willfully cause death. Basically, what it comes down to. Okay. So, Dr. Kaworkian right. method. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, however, you can do things that will probably result in death, but you're not causing it. So, you have someone who is on life support. And, and, and also the people who are listening should not take this as a religious ruling. You should talk to your, your local scholar and your local physicians. I'm giving you the, the general. Uh, uh, so you have someone who's on life support. The physician says there's a, a next to zero chance uh, of recovery. They're, they're brain dead or however it is that they describe it. Mm -hmm. uh, the family members might still be hoping and praying for a miracle, yeah. right? Uh, and, uh, and, they should, uh, as long as they're understanding that the likelihood uh, is is not going to be very high. I mean, that's why we call it a miracle anyway. But um, uh, so from uh, a general Islamic perspective, um, it is okay to pull the plug. Uh, I know that there is something that a physician offers in case the person is still alive and they're experiencing tremendous amounts of pain. There's some sort of injection that they can take that will then ensure death you can't do that i mean are you exactly yeah so sorry? if i could comment yeah. on the general what okay. in palliative care our society and yeah. what i what we advocate for is first of all to your point uh euthanasia um is simply off the table mm -hmm. in um uh from a as palliative care as in our society as palliative care providers it, it is not uh something that's legal uh nor do we advocate for that Got it. Um, but if it gets to the point of somebody asking for euthanasia, then we are not palliating enough. Mm -hmm. So with good palliative care, you that issue of euthanasia has never come up. That's a fascinating you, point. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and then you have physician-assisted suicide, which um, is uh, legal in one state at least. But even that... We are um, against that because, again, with, with good palliation, you, uh, it shouldn't resort to such drastic thoughts of euthanasia, which is um, the physician purposely takes the life away of a patient, which is illegal and wrong. Or physician says suicide where uh, a physician gives a prescription to a patient and says, here you go, you take care of this at home. So for, so for palliative care providers, it's, it's sad that it gets to that point. Um, and then there's the right to die, which is a whole different discussion, but we uh, we kind of, we, we would purposely just stay away from that mm -hmm. issue as palliative care providers. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Fair. So, um, so Umar's question then about uh, whether or not there's an active administration of, a, uh, of an injection or limit any pain that the... Um, good question. So I'm going to answer it by the principle of double effect. Okay. Right? which is my intent is to treat the pain. Yes. My intent is to treat the pain. 
And because I'm treating your pain and distress, the end result could be more sedation. I accept that side effect. Mm -hmm. So this comes up a lot, especially uh, trainees and, um, you know, an academic center, like, oh my God, what are we doing here? Are we, nurses will say, well, I don't want to kill the patient, okay? But if, if you're giving the medication at the appropriate dosage and frequency based on symptoms that you document and you see, okay, and the end result is the patient is sleeping peacefully, and now, Omer, we're talking, truly talking about very active stages of dying, that is not euthanasia, that is not physician-assisted suicide, that is actually good end-of-life experienced medical care. I really appreciate what you, what, what you shared because, again, anecdotally speaking, I remember in the instance of my father where the doctor kind of walked us through the process of what it would be like to actually, quote unquote, pull the plug. But in order to even for us as a family to have that conversation, it was the advice of personal physicians that we knew in the family who, based on the numbers, right, because the actual physicians providing the care didn't tell us one way or another, right? Mm. But it was actually after consulting with people, members of the family who happened to be physicians, and they said, well, these are the numbers. Um, Billy Ribbon, considerations, I forget all, the, all of the other metrics. And, you know, the physician who was a family relative said, if it was my father, this is what I would do. Basically, it, it, you know, from a spiritual perspective, it's entirely likely. It's entirely likely that the ruh, the spirit, has already sort of transcend, uh, right. tr transitioned, and it's just the body now. And then, when we made the decision to go ahead and basically withhold uh, any of the life support, they had an entire process, step by step, by which the essentially the body shuts down. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, and that was extremely um, comforting because we were able to then j do typically what. Muslims do vis-a-vis -vis end of end of life rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. In medical ethics, we say that withholding, meaning I don't uh, put a feeding tube in. Mm -hmm. um, withholding, meaning, for example, in a in a patient with um, advanced dementia who's um, not eating because the disease process in the brain being a failed organ or a failing organ. Mm is not firing the neurons for a patient to swallow and eat versus um, withdrawing, which is I take something away, is the same ethical moral standard in medical ethics. So my question to you is in uh, your expertise, the issue of two feeds in a terminal condition comes up quite frequently. And it's not just the Muslim faith is actually uh, any faith or any belief system because food is life. Uh, I know instances where this becomes like a real political issue it, where it, it was like, you know, with, with, with feeding tubes. Right. Yeah. So I can say all I want that the medical evidence shows that in end stage dementia, so dementia is the brain can't function and you lose your functional abilities and you stop talking, you stop eating, you're bed bound, that the tube feed is not going to improve your quality of life. Mm -hmm. And there's studies that show they're not, not going to improve long-term survival. It uses restraints. Patients are tied up in order to get the two feet in. But how do you address that from a spiritual, uh, mm. religious standpoint mm. on the issue of two feeds as the question comes up? Is this allowed not to pursue a two feed? Mm -hmm. So, and once again, uh, I have to emphasize this is not a fatwa. People who have a similar situation should, should talk to the local scholars that they trust. Uh, from what I'm hearing in terms of how you're describing it, you're saying that if they are given food through the tube, it is not going to regenerate the lost brain power, right? Correct. And so if what we're saying is that they are fundamentally brain dead. No, the, they're not brain they're dead. Not their brain, brain dead. is, they have end stage dementia, so they're not talking, they're not eating, they're in bed, they're they're conscious. They're they're conscious. They're there, but they're not even responding to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not able to respond, uh, but they're conscious and they're processing. As far as you can gather, or you don't know. Mm. Um, you're not even sure of that. Yeah, yeah. There, I think it's. Well, I'm talking about yeah. your classic. Yeah. End stage Alzheimer's dementia patient. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Omar, you had brought up 
mm -hmm. dementia before you yeah. know, earlier. Yeah, I think uh, that's uh, there's still enough variables for me to to say that this is, or you would even say it's not the same as someone's hooked up to a machine, and if you pull the plug, it's it's over. Yeah, yeah. Um, that I wouldn't be able to give you um, uh, a general answer for for that type of situation. You know, Got it. You know. So in a lot of these situations, you really have to like dig into the specifics. Oh, absolutely. And like, yeah. like, and make yeah. a proper right. ruling. Yeah, that's why you, you hear me keep emphasizing. You know, like, do not uh, take this as a ruling. Yeah. It, it sounds yeah. like what I'm hearing is these are very complicated situations. Yeah. Everything requires like high touch empathy, high touch knowledge mm -hmm. on on both the the medical and the spiritual side. Right. Um, no, certainly, and I and I think everything you've shared, I think, adds so much color to what I imagine people haven't even considered when it comes to these type of issues. So I really appreciate both of you. I want to talk about the other component to palliation, which is not end of life, but just symptom management, administrating care. I you know issues like permissibility of certain drugs or therapeutics comes into question. So I I, I wanted to ask you, Omar, and then certainly have Dr. Ansari comment around those uh, type mm -hmm. of issues that mm -hmm. you... So the, the the general principle from within Islamic law perspective is that if the consumption of something by default is haram, then you want to see if you can use uh, something else that's okay. available. So a couple of different examples would be alcohol-based medicine, uh, medical marijuana. Uh, there is that recent surgery uh, where the, a human had a pig heart, right? And so, so the default general answer for all of those would be no, right? Okay. Uh, nevertheless, uh, <clears throat> if we're getting to specific case by case uh, 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 questions, then all of those become uh, uh, in consideration. I've not come across any scholar at this point who said that we can imagine uh, a scenario in which you would have a pig heart uh, would be allowed, right? Uh, uh, but nevertheless. Uh, and a, part of the point I think that they, that uh, and the the few fatwas that I read was that uh, there are still many other options, normal human halal options that are available. But the basic point being that if you uh, have no other options, but this will sustain health, life, well-being, then it is back on the table. Okay. The, the, yeah. So there's that whole thing of like Islam came to preserve those six things yeah. and in, in a pr order of priority and so forth. So, so yeah, I mean, this is what we speak of as the principle of darura, and a lot of times darura is invoked in all kinds of different ways. But here, all, everyone's familiar Just with yeah, uh, with familiar with this principle of necessity that if you have uh, so pork is absolutely forbidden, right? These certain things to consume, four things to consume, uh, foods are absolutely forbidden, but if you are not driven by desire, but you're driven by the pur purpose of sustaining life, then take as much uh, as will sustain life, right? That's the general mm -hmm. uh, shuddy principle that puts everything then on the table. It, are those issues, are those questions that you sometimes have to navigate or help patients navigate, Dr. Ansari? Not really, you okay. know. Okay. Um, I mean, medical marijuana comes up. Okay. Um, you know, I, I don't have, um, I work at a Catholic institution, so mm -hmm. we're limited, uh, as, yeah. you know. Uh, we I are in the same institution. In the same institution. Yeah. So, uh, but um, I will say that. So that's interesting. So, because you're both of you are, are part of a Catholic institution, um, that's not even something that's on the table. Like you, like so, Omar Bhai. Yeah. You mentioned the fact that everything becomes on the table. Mm -hmm. Yet, so you have institutions me, that limit that. Me as uh, uh, as a chaplain, I'm working 100 percent in my capacity as a Muslim, regardless of context. Right, love it. Uh, Dr. Ansari, as a physician, he is bound by by uh, the rules of the uh, the institution. Yeah. yeah, so I may not be able to prescribe medical marijuana, but if I feel that it is helpful, I can tell the patient that hey, this may be helpful to you, but we cannot. Yeah, we cannot prescribe okay. it. Exactly. So as again, I, thank you. That was really enlightening. Um, you know, uh, as we conclude, I think it's important to cover. I think an area that, regardless of of age, regardless of health status, I think all of us can be mindful of and consider, which is the um, you know advanced directives, which is you know composing a will or last testament. So if you could, both of you, talk about that. The uh, speaking from from the dean perspective, yeah, I do think everyone regardless of age, uh, should have a will, yeah. uh, even if it's the rudiments of a will, some sort of a will. 
uh, and and then speaking from within the Dean and Iman perspective, uh, uh, I think people should face the reality of what is the reality of life and, and start exploring all these things, especially so that when you are being tested with something as, as huge as your own uh, uh, illness or your loved one's illness, you're far better prepared. And I mean, that I think is just, you know, pretty straightforward, obvious advice anyway. You know, right. if you, uh, one of the benefits of Dean is to navigate this world. And the more you, you immerse yourself in the Dean, the better you're going to be in navigating the world. Uh, and again, you may demur this quite on, on this question, but is there, it, w would you even go as far as saying that, uh, having a wasiya is either wajib or mustahab. So, so when we're speaking of, of mandatory or recommended, this depends upon the school because, and this also depends on the context you're in. And what okay. I mean by this is that if we are in a theoretical Islamic polity, then your will is already set. You have to decide what to do with the remaining third, right? There you What's go. What's going to happen right. with the with the rest of it is already set. But right? for those of us living in the United States, for example, then, then you have to have a will. Right? Okay, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. So, so then. Would you go on the record as saying that it's something that is at at, at bare minimum mustahab? So, so I'm not going to use the like our terms, right? Because uh, then I get in trouble. But I would say it's <laughs> mandatory. And I would say as a physician, yeah. thank you yeah. for filling those advanced directives out. Yeah, and I will say again, anecdotally, uh, since I have um, probably you know talked about this more than I ever have on air uh, or or publicly, is the fact that the fact that my father sat us down about a month prior to, you know, his passing away. And I think it was all three of us, like meaning his, you know, like three uh, children and oh, read in toto his last will and testament mm -hmm. made that decision fast forward, you know, a month later, or maybe it was two months later, uh, where we had to make that decision around basically essentially pulling the plug again, uh, so much easier because it was very clear in terms of what he desired and what mm -hmm. he had put in his uh, last testament. So again, if that anecdote is meaningful to anyone listening, um, highly recommended having those conversations with yeah, your parents, means. with your siblings, with loved ones. Supporting your point, uh, every single uh, situation I've been involved with in which uh, the person who's passed away has already taken care of these things, okay. including their, their, the details of their funeral, their burial, um, and uh, if they've even had the discussions, it's made those, those challenges so much easier, right? right? So you're giving a rahma to your family members when you're taking care of these things for Absolutely. Yourself. I mean, yeah. um, you cited a, a, a piece in the uh, New England, uh, you know, Journal of Medicine. You know, I, I don't know if we're going to find pieces that are like, because we don't have metrics around this, but I imagine in terms of like exactly what you said, uh, Omar Pai, which is the, the, comf the level of comfort that for family members and loved ones, when a person has a very clear, mm -hmm. explicit, uh, you know, last testament. So... The, uh, correct. And to add to that, it is very important for listeners um, that not only do you have an advanced uh, or, or living will and advanced directives, but also to name a healthcare power of attorney that you think will best represent you and your values and your preferences when you can't speak on your own behalf. Because if there is no power of attorney mentioned, then every state, as you know, Pervez has a surrogacy act. That's right. So it, uh, I can't emphasize that enough for our listeners. Name your healthcare power of attorney. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be your spouse. I mean, usually it is. Oh, so it doesn't have to be an attorney. This no, no healthcare that. power of attorney. So it's a yeah. form uh -huh. where you're naming your healthcare surrogate uh, who's gonna make to make your for decisions you. for yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. So it's I mean, not much like just, any other power of attorney, right, where the person yeah. who's on the right. you know who's the recipient, right. the uh, mm -hmm. the assign, um, assignee doesn't have to be an attorney. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other thing, which a uh, whole long discussion, maybe for another time, is along with advanced directives and living will, is uh, the do not resuscitate mm -hmm. yes. order. And that is filled with um, a lot of angst also. I, and, but I will say, like, with the, with, and I, I, I don't work on wills and trusts. So, I mean, you know, again, I'm not speaking from experience, but I know when my father did it uh, and my parents did it, they consulted an attorney. And usually an attorney can help with that clause and uh, the language that, that is found within the clause. But again, that's, I would say, imperative. And that do not resuscitate yes. order is something that you should be talking about with your physicians, uh, spiritual counselors, spiritual counselor, mm -hmm. especially in a serious illness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because there's that realm, which, you know, in healthcare, we're probably not having enough of those conversations and 
I can tell we can, we can say with surety that having CPR done to you and not having a pulse for a certain amount of time is not a good outcome. Mm. Yeah. Right. So, you know, one last thing I would say as we're wrapping up here, uh, we talked a lot today uh, and the audience is probably listening, um, depending on the speed you're listening to this podcast, probably overwhelmed a bit mm. right now. And this was a lot to take in. You know, if I could give one almost parting mm -hmm. comment, this is complicated. Um, so have conversations preemptively about, you know, advanced directives, living walls and all that. But especially in our community, our parents are getting older. We were just at an event two days ago where I saw literally three or four generations in one room. That was amazing, right? I saw a lot of frailty in that room, and I saw a lot of youth and energy. So, you know, in your with your physicians and your communities, ask about palliative care. Talk to a palliative care provider if you're in, in a serious illness uh, situation with yourself or your family. There is no right or wrong answer in terms of how you want to approach your care. But listen to your heart, discuss your values, discuss your preferences with your, and um, always think about your loved one and what they would want. Yeah. And, and just going full circle, I, I, you know, I talked at the beginning of the podcast about folks who put their head in the sand and having loved ones do that. If anything, we've seen the benefits of not doing that. Mm -hmm. um, Islam talks about talk, you know, going mm -hmm. to some graves and cemeteries, but by extension, you could say there's benefit in doing the advanced directive and the will and mm -hmm. the do not resuscitate all those things. There's like yeah. a benefit and, right. and inshallah, if a fraction or all of the listeners can do that, that's, yeah. that would be an amazing <laughs> benefit fact, of this podcast. Right. Of you, us absolutely. Getting, In fact, right. I was going to save this for the very, very end, but I, I love uh, like the fact that you mentioned that at the outset. And I was going to ask you, Omar, you think that if you were to prescribe this podcast for the loved ones in your life who don't want to have these conversations, do you think we've made a compelling, you know, argument to do so? Inshallah, uh, I hope yeah. Adam, if if all the listeners can do it, like if you're listening, please take action. Mm -hmm. um, if a fraction of listeners can do it, that's a blessing as well. Inshallah, but I, I hope and pray like the more yeah. the more folks can take action, then then, then, then they will benefit. I, I one last thing about the guilt. You know, family members feel guilty. Mm -hmm. Just remember that the disease has spoken, right? Death will come. Uh, and there should really be no judgment on whatever decision a patient and a family make, whether they want to make a decision to be fully aggressive and um, continue to get ICU care and fight complications and never leave a hospital. That's okay. And your physicians will respect that. And at the same time, if that decision is made, I have a serious illness I want to be home. I want to be with my loved ones. I want a spirit. I want more of a spiritual end of my life. I don't want to be near a hospital. Mm -hmm. I don't want that feeding tube. I don't want. Um, I, if my heart stops, I want to die a natural death. That is okay, also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, in conclusion, uh, two reflections. One, uh, Doctor Sorry, you mentioned about the guilt, and uh, absolutely. So there is. Uh, ultimately, we are all surrendering to Allah's will. And the more I can make peace with, with Allah's will, the more the journey through life becomes more palatable. And then the practice for that begins now. Um, um, and then on top of that, the other point to consider related to getting all your paperwork done ahead of time is the simple point that however much of your life you do not take care of yourself right now, you are putting the burden on your loved ones uh, yeah. later on. That's right. And this includes your own physical fitness, but as well as your 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 paperwork matters yeah. okay. and again anecdotally um, i know of instances where literally people are not on speaking terms anymore yes because of the fact that things got really dicey mm -hmm. and uh you know towards at the end of a loved one's you know life are not, are not on yeah. speaking terms and they anymore. were probably on fine terms prior and then no yes. absolutely count countless examples yeah. countless, countless examples right exactly so Thank you, both of you. I mean, I mean this. This is, I think, a very, very, very important and a, a very enlightening conversation for me. Yeah, he um, heavy but beneficial. That's inshallah. right. That's right. I um, I guess is, is there? Would you recommend any sources that people can perhaps read, consult? Uh, if you've done any papers that people can consume that are more for, say, laity uh, and not for a medical journal, Dr. Ansari, and then same question for Omer, mm -hmm. uh, and then where can people find you or engage you if our le listeners want to reach out or find out more about you? Yeah, so uh, my journals are more, uh, or my publications are more medical, uh, teaching clinicians on primary palliative care concepts. Sure. Um, 
I will say, um, you know, almost every hospital now has some semblance of a palliative care program. So I, I cannot express enough advocate, advocate for your family, advocate for your loved ones, advocate for yourself. If you feel things are not going the right direction, ask for a palliative consultation uh, and your providers uh, should listen. As far as where to find me, I, you know, I'm not a big social media person. If you want to know more, more about palliative care in your personal space, your institution uh, should definitely have a palliative care consultation program where you can uh, seek out that information. And Omer, as far as the spiritual aspects, as you had mentioned before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in terms of, of a lot of this, we would find this discussion in, in bioethics. Uh, I'm biased towards Chicago. And so two of the, the, the lead voices are Sheikh Amin Holwadia and then uh, likewise Dr. Asim Padella, um, who is especially very good at, at aggregating a lot of the discussions on, on bioethics and such. Mm -hmm. But the simple point is, uh, Dean is all about engaging with reality, saying this is what reality is and this is how you engage. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to, to run away and life is harder that way. Yeah, no, I appreciate you saying that. In fact, that reminded me, uh, if people want position papers or white papers, uh, I, I know recently they actually held a conference around these issues of bioethics is uh, Daryl Klassen. And you can yeah. go to the Daryl Klassen website and find position papers from both Sheikh Amin, Asim Padilla, and others. And as I said, they're, they're constantly sort of thinking about these type of issues. Thank you, both of you, for taking the time and doing this. Omer, a uh, special shout out. Appreciation for being, I think, the uh, fourth reappearance on the show. And definitely not going to be your last. So, it's, it's love, always but, a privilege to be here. I always oh, appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, mm -hmm. listeners, as always, questions, comments, feedback, you can email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Or you can hit us up on Facebook, Twitter. If you like the podcast, please leave a review, feedback. Always appreciate it. And if you would like to support the show, you can become a patron of the show by going to patreon.com slash Diffuse Congruence. And thank you as always for listening and catch us on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. Mm-hmm. <laughs>